Thank you for listening to this STS roundtable discussion on ECMO. Uh, my name is Glenn Whitman. I'm the director of uh, the cardiac ICU at, at Johns Hopkins University. We have four discussants with us today, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Jay? Uh, Jay Shake from the University of Mississippi. Uh, Nevin Kotz, uh, director of Fax Care and at Johns Hopkins University. Jonathan Haft from the University of Michigan. I'm Aksha from Johns Hopkins. To start today's discussion, I thought we'd address the issue of who, in fact, is a candidate for ECMO. Ash, you want to start? Well, I, I think maybe I'll start with a more provocative look at this. I, I think that the technology and our, our ease of and comfort with using this technology means that almost anybody really is a, is a candidate. And I would uh, kind of submit that we really don't know who's not a candidate. There's some things are, are obvious. I think there are people, uh, the truly elderly, people with terminal uh, diseases, that when they get into extremis, one would, wouldn't you know, offer these sort of solutions to them. But I think we're increasingly seeing what constitutes um, you know, non unsalvageable is becoming murkier and murkier. So I, I'm, I'm actually not entirely clear where those lines uh, are, are drawn. But Jonathan, if you had to bucket the groups, how would you do it? Well, I think if, um, if you consider patients with cardiac failure, uh, I would consider them a candidate if, uh, number one, they need it, so they have failed traditional management of inotropes and maybe balloon pumps, uh, and uh, the patient uh, either has a reversible cause of cardiac failure uh, or could potentially be a candidate as a bridge to a ventricular assist device or heart transplantation. And then from a respiratory perspective, uh, typically ECMO would be considered for patients that have reversible causes of respiratory failure uh, or somebody who is deemed to be a candidate for lung transplantation where ECMO would serve as a bridge. Well, Nevin, in terms of um, using ECMO as a bridge to lung transplant, how, is there a, a time frame when you'd wanna be able to do that? Let me just comment on the uses. The history of ECMO tells us a bit about that. It was first used in neonates. Dr. Bartlett described that, and we did that for meconium aspiration. It was very difficult to make it really work in adults, as Dr. Zapal showed, but it does work in adults, and that's very effective. Now, in terms of circulatory support, the Cleveland Clinic actually had a very early experience with that, and now it is a standard way to bail patients out, for example, if cannot come off bypass, whereas it used to be just a bad. So I think that's very good. As far as lung transplant, um, yes, I think it is, uh, Ash can give us the best perspective on that, but I've certainly seen it effective. What are, what are the results of transplanting a patient uh, who's on ECMO, Ash? Yeah, I think that, you know, certainly we would, we would agree that ECMO is a very viable way to bridge someone to lung transplant. Um, and even that uh, those thresholds are becoming, you know, less um, astringent as time goes on because we're learning more about how to bridge these people. I think, you know, certainly we have got conventional criteria for transplant um, and candidates that you're thinking about bridging to lung transplant should fulfill at least some of those basic criteria. But we're beginning to try to understand while they're being supported what makes someone a candidate for transplant. And that's an area that we're, we're really still working on. I think many of us would, would argue that um, you know, a patient could have a very short ECMO run and be effectively bridged to transplant, but there will be a critical threshold that we're gonna pass where we really want them to mobilize while they're on ECMO, to show recovery of other end organs, to improve the nutritional status, to get them much in the way that we've utilized left ventricular cyst devices to help patients be better prepared for heart transplantation. I think ECMO in the, in the setting of lung transplant is gonna to move to a similar model where we're really trying to get that patient in the best shape possible. And they, they may fail during that support period. And they may be someone that doesn't get to transplant because they didn't meet some of these other criteria. And I think right now the basic criteria, once you pass that short-term support, will get an organ relatively quickly, will we'll be about mobility, nutrition, uh, renal function, and, and obviously neurologic uh, status. J.D., you know, I once heard it said that uh, no one can die on ECMO. I, I've heard it also said that um, ECMO is simply a long, slow death. 
at what point is there a time frame in which ECMO can work, but after which the body's simply going to deteriorate? Well, I think, I think the key phrase over there that I heard, and, and when I walk up to a patient to think about if we should initiate ECMO is, is there a reversible cause? Because that's really where we're going at with this. If you're putting somebody on and then there wasn't a reversible cause, that we're, we get to that decision making, and hopefully we don't have that very often. So early on, actually, you know, in my experience, I think we were actually discontinuing too early uh, with the technology that we have. Um, well, first of all, I think our average run was about, f on f about 14 days. So that's, that's 14 days um, is the average. So you can imagine we have quite a few that are, are less than 14 days, but we have some out, you know, 70 days and stuff like that. So I think where, where's the end? Really, really the trajectory of how the patient is doing, I think, is the good answer. Now, if they have multiple organ failure and, and um, you know, certainly a neurologic injury or something like that, then the tide changes a little bit. So I'm a lot more optimistic now, even at 20 days, than I was when I first started doing this. But what about, um, so should, if you don't know whether the person's got a reversible injury, what about using ECMO as a bridge to deciding whether the guy's got a re reversible injury? Because if, if you do that, there's going to be a tremendous number of candidates for ECMO. There are, and I think even for ARDS or some things that we see, we get a lot of referrals from the medical intensive care unit. They might not necessarily know exactly from a pulmonary standpoint. And, and again, we we're talking about, you know, um, going from uh, for a lung transplant from from ECMO to a lung transplant. But that's a minority of our patients that I'm seeing. That we're seeing that you know H1N1 type of large volumes of patients that are coming our way. So sometimes they don't necessarily know the underlying cause, Glenn, exactly. But um, and it, it, in a way it is that, a bridge to diagnoses. But, but I think we're giving them a chance, a young, young relatively healthy person going into that, uh, going into evaluation, I think uh, that we do use, uh, we do probably put people on that, that have a, not, we're not completely sure of the diagnosis. And I think that's fair in a, in a viable young person, that's fair. Let me change the discussion just to, to talk about things that we all face and see whether we can reach consensus even within this group. Jonathan, what's the, when do you heparinize a person who's on ECMO? <laughs> when they're not bleeding is <laughs> number one. Uh, in a post-cardiotomy situation where you fail to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, our, our, our typical approach is to reverse the anticoagulation and not initiate anticoagulation until we're confident that uh, bleeding has subsided, usually maybe at a period of 24 hours. So uh, that would be VA ECMO. VA ECMO for post-cardiotomy failure to wean from pump. How long can you go without initiating heparin? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. But How long would, would you go before you feel uncomfortable? Uh, I think it has to be assessed on a daily basis. What are the risks of bleeding versus what are the risks of clotting? And so uh, when you're on VA ECMO, obviously you are infusing into the systemic circulation. So any clots that form in the circuit could potentially cause catastrophic injury. So you do have to balance it. Now that being said, we have had patients, uh, particularly patients that have been on for prolonged periods of time uh, for respiratory failure that have had intractable bleeding complications. And we've had patients that have been on no anticoagulation for sometimes weeks at a time uh, addressing those, those bleeding problems. So. Well, for, for all of us, VV ECMO versus VA ECMO. Let's talk about VA ECMO. Does it matter whether you're cannulating the ascending aorta versus cannulating the femoral artery regarding your use of heparin? Well, I think your stroke risk might be less if you're cannulated peripherally, uh, uh, but that also depends upon how much native ejection you have. If you have very little native ejection, then all of your ECMO flow is going to be perfusing uh, uh, the entire circulation, so I do think you'd have substantial risks of embolic events without anticoagulation. I would just add, Glenn, that you know bleeding is still the number one complication, almost irrespective of uh, type of uh, ECMO configuration indication. And so, as Jonathan was pointing out, I think that you know that those competing risks of bleeding and thrombosis are what keeps you up at night with these patients. But in my, my experience, I think the other guys probably would have similar experiences, it's the bleeding that you have more trouble with as time goes on. I do think that the patients that come from uh, medical ICUs, there aren't post-cardiotomy patients, uh, these are folks that you would have a lower threshold to start anticoagulation on. Uh, 
but the postcardiotomy failures are even those people's uh, trauma patients, people who present in shock, um, where they have maybe even a, this sort of acquired coagulopathy. Uh, our experience has certainly been that um, waiting uh, has been the more prudent uh, way to go in, in terms of initiating anticoagulation. Uh, Dr. Shaw brings up an important point. I think there's a difference in the patients who have been on cardiopulmonary bypass and who have not. And the point is we all recognize that prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass creates a coagulopathy. You can actually measure that. Low platelets, you can look at a TEG and so on and so forth. Those patients you can probably hold off a bit on, but it's the H1N1s, the ones that have not been on cardiopulmonary bypass, where I think the issue is more complex. Do you agree? Uh, Nevin, I would say I look at it a little differently, maybe. I think that I see these two patient subsets, uh, VA and VV, as completely different patients, where um, I, I really don't anticoagulate any VV ECMOs unless there's an issue that I want to anticoagulate. There, that we see a lot of, of uh, fiber in the circuit, or things like that that would make me want to anticoagulate. Trauma patients don't have to anticoagulate. With the new circuits that we have, uh, it's just not needed. The VAs are, I handle those differently. I'm more along the lines where waiting till there's no bleeding and going to and then and then trying to run. Uh, we can talk about what levels we run at, but depending on uh, um, you know if there, how, what our risk of bleeding is, that's how we'd adjust our heparin. Uh, but VVs, no heparin. It's have really still occasionally have bleeding issues, but essentially gone. So that's how I manage it. Okay, so HIT positive patient, HIT positive patient, and you're on VA ECMO. Ash, what do you do? I email Jonathan and ask him what they do. <laughs> and Jonathan, the answer is? <laughs> well, I'll tell him what I did in the last case, <laughs> if it was successful. Uh, we, we use uh, heparin alternatives. Uh, Argatraban is the agent that we've used most frequently for patients that are proven HIT positive. Now, it's important to remember that almost every patient that goes on ECMO is going to become thrombocytopenic within a period of time. And uh, we don't initiate uh, a heparin alternative while we wait for our uh, HIT ELISA uh, to come back. Um, we continue to use heparin until it's proven uh, to be HIT just because the phenomena of thrombocytopenia associated with ECMO is, is ubiquitous. And, but then you'd move to a direct thrombin inhibitor. We do, we do. And, and do you need a PTT or do you, can you go by ACTs? We, we do PTTs, so that's the, we do not, once, once we go to our Gatraban, then things change, obviously, but we do, we do ACTs for heparin, yes. Uh, we, we actually have switched to uh, following uh, uh, 10A levels with heparin mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our Gatraban levels mm -hmm. uh, when we use our Gatraban, but in the past, when we used ACTs for all of our anticoagulation, we would actually use ACT for both heparin uh, and for our Gatraban, found okay. to be uh, as effective. Okay. Why would you go to 10As? Why would you why would you do a 10A factor acid? Uh, well, it's supposed to be a, a better reflection of the effect of the heparin. I'll echo that sentiment. I think our experience with ACTs have been very inconsistent, and we've actually, particularly when you're running very low levels of anticoagulation, you may find yourself with an ACT that looks low, but yet your PTT is very high, and that um, uh, that has made us move to using PTT. Um, and 10A levels are, are really an even better way, I think, to uh, be more precise with your level of anticoagulation. It brings out the point that's interesting, though, is the standardization, though, of what we're doing across uh, uh, different different systems and, and how, how different they can be even at centers that are relatively high in volume. It's just very interesting that we haven't yet come to a consensus of how we What's, you know, there aren't great papers on how to manage these issues. So we are using- There aren't. Yeah, there aren't. And so, so we are, you know, behooves us to try to put some of our thoughts together and do this in the future and have some evidence to, to support our decision making rather than what we've done in the last few cases. Absolutely. Let me um, ask another question about standardization. You've got, you're taking care of a patient who's on VA ECMO. He's been peripherally cannulated and he was put on ECMO for heart, for cardiac arrest or shock, cardiogenic shock. What's the importance of decompressing the left ventricle? Jonathan? Uh, you don't always have to decompress the left side of the heart uh, on VA ECMO, but you should be aware that you might need to. And so I think it's important to uh, 
uh, assess whether or not the left ventricle is distended. Uh, a lot of these patients already have pulmonary artery catheters, and if they do, that can be very helpful at telling you that you have a substantial amount of congestion uh, in, uh, in, in the pulmonary circulation. Uh, echocardiograms uh, can be helpful at showing you the size of the left ventricle. It can tell you if your aortic valve is routinely opening uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, that native ejection is decompressing the left side of the heart. So I think you have to be aware of it because if you do have LV distension, you're going to have pulmonary edema and potentially pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, and, and then your opportunity for recovery is, is going to be lost. Okay, so you're peripherally cannulated and, and you transesophageal, transthoracic echo shows that the LV is really full. And this was put in for cardiogenic shock and you want this heart to recover. How do you empty the left ventricle? Jay? Well, Usually at the beginning we try to do pharmacologically where we try to see if we can uh, apply any inotropic support and, and most of the time that that's successful for us. Um, uh, we have uh, probably less of experience than some of the other counterparts at the table, to, but we, we've done it uh, uh, through the, in the cath lab putting uh, uh, transeptally to drainage. Uh, I've had a couple of patient, you know, patients that way not as pleased with the results per se. I'm not sure we always got uh, decompression like we would want as a cardiac surgeon. So uh, I haven't really answered that for myself yet, Glenn. That would be that's an honest uh, answer. Ashwin, what what would you do? I think you, you've got a lot. You got a lot of choices, as Jay was alluding to, and I think um, as Jonathan's alluding to, I think you. I, th I think we've adopted an idea of being very selective uh, about it, using a lot of echocardiography to make sure that you do you have to or not have to. I think if you've got a patient that. Um, you've got a lot of a lot of distension, and you really are, are running into trouble, pulmonary edema, et cetera. Then you know LV venting through the apex is probably a, a powerful way to get yourself out of trouble. If you've then got we'd switch, then we do a median sternotomy and no, and do no, I think you no, you you can, but you don't have to. You can make a a, a small thoracotomy and get access to the LV apex as as, as we have done in the past, um, and put a cannula in that way. I think. Uh, transeptal puncture and an atrial level amount of drainage may be very beneficial in some patients. I think you're going to have to, particularly ones who've got a lot of mitral insufficiency, just as we see in the operating room, you can probably get away with that. Um, every time you introduce these cannulas, though, you introduce risk to the patient. And even, I, I will say anecdotally, that um, if you get a lot of decompression of the left ventricle, you have an opportunity for some even more thrombus formation. If there isn't blood in there, a little bit of ejection, and just to echo it, uh, uh, Jay was uh, talking about having a little bit of inotropic support, let the ventricle beat a little bit, um, I think actually helps you, uh, even in terms of recovery. But um, we're pretty selective about putting in vents, um, even though one can make an argument that it's very reasonable to do it in everybody. I think real world or experience will tell you that you introduce risk to the patient, and uh, whether it's uh, air events, bleeding from the cannulas, um, or stroke related to thrombus. Well, there's another issue with cannulation. Many patients nowadays are put on ECMO peripherally with the femoral vein, femoral artery, and one of the concerns is lower extremity ischemia, and that's well documented in the literature. So if it's going to be a prolonged, let's say longer than six, eight hours, it's thought that you need to adjust your cannulation in such a way there is peripheral perfusion, for example, of the leg distally as well, and that can be done. But it's very easy to forget that and then end up with major problem with the lower extremity. Nevin, should we just, when we cannulate a femoral artery, should we just immediately put a cannula uh, down the SFA or, the post, or a cannula aimed up the posterior tibial just so that we don't have to think about it? Well, some centers do that, and that's in the literature too. There are ways to do it. It's easier to do, of course, if you're directly cutting down on the femoral artery and you can do that easily, but it can be done percutaneously. I would favor that. I think if it looks like it's going to be prolonged ECMO I, and it's peripheral cannulation, I need to provide for the circulation to the lower extremity. You know, we're running out of time and I, I didn't want to lose the opportunity to ask any of the discussants what, what he thinks the future of, of ECMO is going to be. So let's start with Jonathan. Well, uh, there's been a fair amount of uh, technologic advances, I think, in the last decade uh, with ECMO, and as a result of it, you're seeing more ECMO being applied. Uh, I think uh, 
potentially one of the next big advances uh, is going to be coded circuits, circuits that are going to be more biocompatible, uh, less um, uh, likely to form thrombus, uh, and less likely to result in inflammatory responses. So I think that's something that could, could have a huge impact on uh, outcomes, complications, and access to ECMO. Ash, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think that there that this expansion of using ECMO has introduced, uh, reintroduces the ideas of resuscitation science, and that we touched on reversibility, but I think that threshold is absolutely unknown, and that we are going to enter a, a period where we're going to be able to bring people back um, with a lot of innovative therapeutics. Using ECMO is just a platform to stabilize things and bring them back, and I think we're going to learn a lot about how we manage. Uh, other end organs, the brain, the kidneys, um, and even their skeletal muscle to get them through this. I think the future is about is going to be about uh, uh, recovering organs and um, and bridging them to total recovery. Um, Jonathan's group has a, a very provocative case report about someone that they presume was going to be a bridge to lung transplant, going months on on end about with uh, ECMO for end stage lung disease, and which they presume would never get better. But for whatever reason, multiple reasons came up that they couldn't get transplanted, and they recovered. You know, this prolonged period of support that all of us would have said more than the 14 days, more than the 30 days, 50-something days, I think, was your, your patient, and they recovered. I think that's the future. We're going to discover these thresholds that, the, that, that certain patients and, and many of the organs we thought were not recoverable or were going to be uh, salvageable will actually be salvageable, and that, I think, is what the ECMO, ECMO is a platform. That, that's the future for us. Well, pretty exciting. I, I would continue the conversation, but we're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this afternoon.